So is code art? This is a question which people have been asking for, for decades and decades and which I've spent a lot of time thinking about. So when um, Fred asked me to give a talk about the interaction between code and art for this conference, I was like, maybe I could give a talk on this. Is code art? I could try and answer this question. And the more and more I thought about it, the more I researched, the less I cared about this question. Uh, you'll find out more about this later, but I don't want to make a talk about this anymore. I decided instead to talk about so many different things about the relationship between code and art. So I'm going to take more of the approach of this 16th century um, Spanish style of essay, which I found called the Michelania, which is a collection of curiosities or heterogeneous materials that only have in common the arousal of the interest of the compiler and the public, mixing opinion, instruction and fun, and sometimes also moralizing indoctrination. I'll try and go easy on the moralizing indoctrination, but I can't make any promises. So my goal in general for this talk is to give you new ways of seeing, new ways of seeing code, new ways of seeing art, new ways of seeing the relationship between these two things. A really great quote that I found in a lecture um, on the beauty of mathematics. This is from a high school student who was in the audience. They said, since I was very small, I was shown proofs but I was not shown, to use the analogy of music, the beauty in them. There was no taste to what was done in school. When one does music, then one gets into the beauty of the music, not just its rhythm or the theory of music. I thought this was really interesting because it's right. Like When we learn programming, when we learn computer science, when we learn code, we're so often not taught to look at the code and try and appreciate if it's beautiful or not. We're not told to feel a piece of code and the way that we're told to feel a piece of music. I thought this was really interesting. So I want to give us new ways of seeing code and art and the relationship. So I have a bunch of different topics I'm going to cover today. I'm going to start off with a whirlwind tour of mostly Western aesthetics. Um, this is the kind of trail which is most tread um, for teaching aesthetics. Uh, it's mostly filled with um, old racist white men, which is a shame, but those are the people who had the power and wrote the history. So, you know, we get what we get. I'll then move on to briefly what is art questions about um, the nature of art, whether it's an essential property of things, the kinds of things you would get in a, um, a philosophy of art course, basically. And then I have a bunch of topics on code and art, the relationship between these two things, beautiful code on code art itself on language, discovery, knowledge, execution, representation. And then I'm going to finish off in the same place that I started in history, taking a look back, applying all the things that I'm about to talk about to all of the code that we're going to see later. All right, let's start off with our whirlwind history of Western aesthetics. So the aim of this is to give you the necessary foundations to build on for the rest of the talk. I don't want to spend too long boring you with history, although I do think that aesthetic history is, is kind of fascinating. Uh, it wasn't really a separate field of study until the 18th century, but we can trace it all the way back to, uh, to the Greeks. Uh, these friends are Plato and Aristotle. Um, Aristotle saw art as imitation or mimesis. You might be familiar with the term like the platonic realm of forms or something like that where you um, have the idea of these ideas, pure ideas, which are separate from our physical reality, like the idea of five, fiveness rather than, you know, a five written down on a piece of paper or something like that. The platonic ideal of a table rather than a table which my you know, computer is currently sitting on. Uh, Plato saw art as a further removal from that reality of this table. Now I might have a picture or a painting of a table. It's another step away from reality, that realm of ideas. So since Plato saw that art was twice removed from the reality, he kind of didn't really have a very nice idea of art. He saw that he was kind of critical of art and poetry as being poor tools for education and um, ethical teaching. So he didn't really like them. 
Um, Aristotle, however, gave a lot more value to the creative process of poetry in its society. He thought that they were ways which we did learn. And he was also one of the first to give this idea that beautiful things might have some order to them, some symmetry, some definiteness, something which makes them beautiful. Um, he also saw that there was this relationship between things that were beautiful and things that were virtuous or good, which was something which lasted deep into the Renaissance and further as aesthetics were very, very tied into religion. So the two main things from Greek aesthetics I want to just pull out again are the idea of art as imitation, of imitating something in the physical world um, as a piece of art. And then also the idea as beauty and virtue being um, very, very closely interlinked. On kind of a aside, people misunderstand a lot of how like, Greek and, and Roman art and things like that would have looked. You look at like the statue of uh, Caligula, the Roman emperor, and it looks very severe and minimalist. And maybe you think this was like how it would have looked back then, but it actually would have looked more like a 3D model from a late 2000s adventure game that did pigment analysis to work out how this would have actually been painted uh, at the time. I thought it was kind of funny. But moving on from, um, from Greek aesthetics into medieval aesthetics, which were very, very much drawn from the same ideas um, that Plato and Aristotle and some other Greek philosophers took, but then viewed through the lens of uh, medieval biblical understanding. Uh, this here pictured is St. Augustine, and he said, I have to ask whether something is beautiful because it pleases or whether it pleases because it is beautiful. And I will receive no doubt the answer that it pleases because it is beautiful. This was something which was very, very common for a large period of history. The idea that beauty is essential, that it's that some object is objectively beautiful, not that I view something as beautiful and you view something else, that beauty is contained within the object that embodies beauty. Moving on to the Renaissance, um, which is a period where the skill of an artist was really highly valued, where reality, depth, emotion were highly valued, started to slowly shift away from the idea of beauty as like a, a religious experience and that tying into virtue, moving towards a response to what the artist had created, what the artist's skill had managed to put into this piece of art. Uh, for example, this piece is called The Ideal City. Uh, it's actually one of three very similar paintings that people aren't quite sure who um, painted them. But note the lines of the, the buildings on the sides there, how it forms this, this single point of perspective. This was kind of when this single point perspective idea came about in the history of art, in the Western world at least. Um, so this is when we started to have this um, greater value on the skill of the artist. Um, the single point perspective was mostly taken from um, a piece of writing called On Painting, where the, the, the writer viewed art as like looking through a window and capturing what you see. Again, this idea of art as imitation. Um, it's also when we got ideas like sfumato, which is the, the technique of the, the little smudging around the eyes of the Mona Lisa, or uh, chiaroscuro, which is the high contrast between those light and dark shades. So again, we still had that idea of art as imitation, like viewing through the window, but then we also had the idea of beauty in skill, in the skill of the artist creating something beautiful. Now, if we move on to the 1750s, this is when the term aesthetics, as we kind of currently use it, was actually coined by Baumgarten. Uh, he considered it the knowledge of the senses. This is when we start to see aesthetics as a um, an actual realm of study itself uh, being started. Um, Baumgarten was one of the first people to give this idea that art functions both cognitively and perceptually, that it's not just that we are responding with our from how our senses are reacting to some piece of art, but that we're also engaging our minds in it. This cognitive perceptual, both of these working together. We'll see this coming up a lot in the, in the rest of the talk. 
Now, if we move on to the empiricists, this is when we started to break down some of the ideas from earlier thoughts of aesthetics. Uh, David Hume said that beauty is no quality in things themselves. It exists merely in the mind which contemplates them, and each mind perceives a different beauty. Uh, you might be familiar with that, like the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, uh, things like that. Uh, by the way, this is a statue which is in Edinburgh, which is where I am right now. Uh, the idea is if you rub the toe, you get good luck. So lots of people have, have rubbed that toe over the years. Uh, but this is starting to get, we, ha we had that idea earlier that beauty is essential, that it's, uh, that it's objective. And this started to deconstruct that, um, that beauty is in fact subjective. Moving on to um, Immanuel Kant, who was one of the most influential people in the entire history of aesthetics, one of the people who really like started it as um, the field which it is now. He was also a terrible person, massive racist, but oh well. Uh, you might be familiar with his writings if you've studied the modern masterpiece of moral philosophy, which is The Good Place. Uh, here's Chidi holding Critique of Good Reason. Uh, good Place is amazing, would recommend. But uh, he had a bunch of interesting things to say. He said that in all judgments by which we describe anything as beautiful, we allow no one to be of another opinion. Uh, this gets the idea of beauty claiming universality. So the, the thing here is that Kant um, also thought that beauty was subjective, but that when we say something is beautiful, we kind of expect people to agree with us. Uh, I don't actually think that this is true and we'll get a bit into it why later, uh, but this was a very uh, influential thought. Um, he also thought that um, the aesthetic experience, we found beautiful objects to be purposive without purpose. These objects which um, seem like they're made for something, that they have a reason to exist, but that they don't really fulfill any function for us. Uh, I also disagree with this, and we'll get to that later. Uh, but this idea was taken even further by Schopenhauer, who is one of my favorite people in the history of aesthetics because he was so sad. He thought that um, we, we had this intrinsic will to live, which causes us to forever strive forwards, forwards ceaselessly, uh, never quite getting what we want because there's always this striving and that's why humanity is in a constant state of suffering. He, he was wonderful. Uh, I mean, he was also an awful person, but his, his philosophy was really interesting. Um, and he thought that um, aesthetic experience is one of those few times where we are actually willless, he called it, when we are not seeking to fulfill any of our needs to live. We're just trying to, we're just experiencing something. So that's where I'm going to leave the kind of history of, um, of Western aesthetics. Of course, there are aesthetic systems all around the world, which are, um, are quite different. For instance, um, Heather Atwan writes about um, Native American indigenous aesthetics. After two decades of the study of Native American art and a lifetime of being in the cultural community, it's my belief that indigenous aesthetics remain undiscernible using Western cultural analysis systems. And the reason she says this is because we like to try to take the aesthetics of something and separate it from everything else and then consider it in relation to other things like, uh, like politics or ethics or um, or technical skill, all of these things. Whereas trying to do that to um, North American um, native art is fundamentally misunderstanding how their art works and you can't separate the aesthetics from um, any of the other things which embody it. Um, she even goes further to say that it's my belief and contention that all that not all indigenous aesthetic knowledge can or should be documented. I believe that there's a barrier that must remain in force keeping knowledge that is spiritually taught from becoming materialized within scholarship, which I thought was really, really interesting. Another resource on non-Western aesthetics I'd highly recommend is um, In Praise of Shadows which is a uh, look at traditional Japanese aesthetics in, in contrast to Western aesthetics. And it also considers uh, an alternate modern Japanese aesthetic had Japan not been subject to Western colonialism. It's a really beautiful book, uh, very sad, but very beautiful. That leads me to the end of my whirlwind tour. 
And we can now move on to this question, what is art? A story I always really liked about this is um, Arthur Danto, who is a well-known um, art philosopher, art critic, was in the University of Berkeley uh, in the art department, walking the corridors. You know, there's rooms full of art, full of sculpture, full of installations, abstract art, um, all kinds of stuff. And he walked past this room and looked in and it was a room in the middle of being painted. And he thought to himself, OK, is this a art installation called Paint Job or are they just painting this room? And this led him to a bunch of thoughts about the nature of art and what is art. How can I tell if this is a piece of art or not? Um, and this actually ties into a lot of, um, of advancements in uh, modern art in the 20th century, such as The Fountain by Duchamp, where he literally saw this urinal in the, the window of a shop, bought it, and then submitted it to an art exhibition um, because he was very fed up with the, the art world of the time. He was very elitist, that kind of wanted to deconstruct everything. And this exhibition said, well, if you pay the, the entry fee, we'll exhibit um, any piece of art you send us. Uh, they technically exhibited this piece, although they did hide it behind a curtain for the entire time, which is kind of funny. And then um, a few decades later, Andy Warhol with his uh, Brillo boxes, this was taking the, the design of just a box of Brillo pads, a thing you could just buy from a shop, building something which looked identical, um, was different in some very slight ways like construction, but looked the same. And then putting it in the context of an art um, gallery and saying, okay, well, is this art now? Was it art before? When did it become art? I'm trying to ask all of these questions. Uh, interestingly enough, the person who did design the Brillo boxes originally was an abstract expressionist, which I find kind of funny. Um, but there's a lot of ideas about what constitutes art. People have spent a lot of time coming up with descriptions, criteria, ways of saying, okay, here's how we categorize what is art and what is not art. Uh, these are called essentialist theories of art. Things which say, okay, there are things which are art and there are things which are not art and these are separate categories and we can have some way of differentiating the two. Myself, I'm very much uh, um, an anti-essentialist. My favorite quote on this question, what is art, is from uh, Morris Weitz. Aesthetic theory, all of it, is wrong in principle in thinking that a correct theory on what art is, is possible, because it radically misconstrues the logic of the concept of art. Its main contention, that art is amenable to real or any kind of true definition, is false. Its attempt to discover the necessary and sufficient properties of art is logically misbegotten for the very simple reason that such a set, and consequently such a formula about it, is never forthcoming. Basically taking everyone who has spent decades, centuries trying to come up with ways of differentiating what art is and what art is not, saying this is the wrong question, that we're wrong fundamentally in trying to do this. Uh, he then goes on to apply uh, Wittgenstein's idea about family resemblance to art. So family resemblance is this idea that we have um, some model of what a, like a chair is, for instance. We, we have a, a fundamental knowledge of, of what a chair is. And then if we see some other object and we say, yeah, th this kind of matches my model and understanding of what a chair is, I'm also going to call this thing a chair, that this is how we expand our, um, our understandings of categories for, through family resemblance. And uh, Weitz does a similar kind of thing with art. He says that we often, we, we have... Um, objects that we have had an experience of as art. And then when we have a similar experience to something else, which might be very different in form, um, then we can say, oh yeah, I see the resemblance in how I reacted to this, that family resemblance growing out our personal idea of what art is, which is both a subjective thing and a personal thing. And this is what allows us to, for instance, look at uh, shark suspended in formaldehyde and maybe say, I think that for me, I react to this, I experience this as art. Or to look at a mathematical formula, like e to the i pi equals negative one and say, I 
think this is art, I experience this as art. Or to look at a piece of C++ code and say, I think this is beautiful. So is code art? This is the wrong question. I don't think we should be answering this. I don't think we can answer this, not in a way which makes sense. So I'm not gonna try and answer this question. Instead, I'm gonna talk about all of these different things about code and art and the interaction between them. Beautiful code. Now, one issue that we constantly have is in this um, mismatch between people's views of the scientific and the aesthetic. They think that these are two separate concepts. Um, Nelson Goodman writes, most of the trouble in differentiating the aesthetic from the scientific can be blamed on the domineering dichotomy between the cognitive and the emotive. On the one side, we put sensation, perception, inference, conjecture, all nervous inspection and investigation, fact and truth. On the other, pleasure, pain, interest, satisfaction, disappointment, all brainless effective response, liking and loathing. This keeps us from seeing that in aesthetic experience, the emotions function cognitively. That these are not separate things, that these are fundamentally tied together. You cannot have an emotional experience with something without it also, um, you also experiencing it cognitively and vice versa. If you were at CBPP a couple of years ago, uh, you would know that Nelson Goodman has a contemporary in the shape of uh, Kate Gregory. Kate Gregory told us that our code shows emotions, that the emotions function cognitively, that our code encodes how we're feeling about things, that our code is both emotive and cognitive. In fact, Kate says, by choosing to show positive emotions in your code, your code will be easier to read and maintain. If I can kind of run with that a little bit, um, the, experience, the feelings we get when we experience something beautiful are some of the most positive that exist. So surely it follows that if we make our code beautiful, then it becomes better for some value of better, easier to read, maintain, something like that. And I think there's a lot of different facets to this. When is this idea of functional beauty? For instance, if we take this code sample, maybe you think that this is beautiful compared to a uh, uh, more imperatively styled um, implementation. Um, you know, we could implement this with a bunch of for loops and manual data marshalling and variable declarations and all of that, or we could state our intent and build up a pipeline of these operations saying exactly how we not how we want this thing to be done, but just how we want to do it. This idea of functional beauty. Um, I read, read a paper which defined this, that saying an object is functionally beautiful to the extent that its aesthetic properties contribute to its overall performance. The functional beauty of an object enhances its fulfilling its primary function. So if the primary function of this is to you know, format a calendar, um, the aesthetics of this code is also interacting with how well it does this and how well, not only how well it achieves formatting the calendar, but also how well it achieves in communicating this to us, the reader of some code. We could also think about form. I don't necessarily mean, you know, the IOCCC style of like the code being in a certain form, which looks like a shape, and maybe you think the shape is beautiful. I'm, I'm not super interested in that. And I also don't want to spend too much time on code formatting, but there is a sense that if you maybe think that this way of formatting code is beautiful compared to this, if I move the line over, or if I format it more like this, or if I introduce a bunch of intermediate variables, there is a way in which this formatting changes how we perceive this code, both in a subjective way of whether I think this is beautiful and also how well I understand this. Uh, another thing about beauty, which people talk about a lot, is simplicity. Um, we, people say a lot like the, um, the simple is beautiful, these kinds of things. And we have the same concept in code. We call it the KISS principle. Keep it, sim keep it simple, silly, or whatever formulation you would like. Uh, Schopenhauer has this to say on simplicity and the KISS principle. 
any beautiful mind full of ideas would also always express itself in the most natural, simple, and straightforward way, anxious to communicate its thoughts to others and thus relieve the solitude that he must experience in a world such as this. Schopenhauer is so sad, I love him. But conversely, intellectual poverty, confusion, and wrongheadedness clothe themselves in the most labored expressions and obscure turns of phrase in order to conceal petty, trivial, bland, or trite thoughts in difficult and pompous expressions. And surely you have encountered this if you have found some code which you consider to be just a bit clever for its own good. Uh, I actually asked this on Twitter um, if anyone had good examples of. Um, of code examples which are you know, too clever for their own good. And uh, actually Fred sent me this one. So this, this is a for loop, okay? Declares a variable, a Boolean variable, B initialized to true. Its continuation is a comma separated expression, which first calls apply with if B is true, it calls apply with one. If B is false, it calls apply with 42. And then this loop continues as long as B is true. Then on every iteration, B is set to false. So what happens in this code is it initializes B to true. It calls apply with one. It continues because B is true. It sets B to false, then calls apply with 42 and stops because B is false. This code is exactly the same, functionally speaking, as this code. These are the same. Now, maybe you think that this code is beautiful in its simplicity and minimalism. Like, maybe you think this is beautiful, like a Joe Bear painting is beautiful, something like this. Or, or maybe you think it's beautiful both for its simplicity and minimalism, but also its utility, like maybe a, a handcrafted spoon or something. These are objects which are are beautiful, but they also fulfill uh, a purpose. Uh, coming back to that Kant quote, which is wrong. Um, but I think this one is maybe beautiful in the way that like a Bekshinsky painting is beautiful. You don't really know what's going on and you don't know why they did it like this, but you're kind of scared. Um, for the record, I do think Bekshinsky paintings are beautiful and they're astounding, but <laughs> I think there is a, a parallel to be drawn. Uh, an example from my own life, I had an interview and uh, I was given one of these take-home tests, um, you know, the ones that you have to spend hours on and hours and hours and you don't get paid for it and then they just reject you. That's not what happened, but um, it's a common thing in our industry, unfortunately. But anyway, I had this take-home um, project I had to do. And, you know, I wanted to show that I was smart. I wanted to show that I was good at C++, that I knew what I was doing. So I had this single function, which was used, well, this function, which was used in one single place. It was a recursive function. So I was like, oh, well, I know what I could do. Since this is only used in one place, surely it makes more sense to like make it a lambda and put it closer to the call site. Uh, but since it's recursive, we don't have recursive lambdas, I'm going to have to use the Y combinator. I know what that is because I'm smart and I know what I'm doing and my interviewer will see that. Uh, the Y combinator is a way of essentially turning a lambda into, a, or rather turning a closure into a recursive one. So it's like, okay, I'll do this. I'll implement the Y combinator. So I implemented code, which looks kind of like this. Don't spend too long looking at it. My intention isn't for you to know what this is doing, just to note that this is a lot of code and it's fairly complicated. So I wrote all of this stuff just so that one single call site, I could do something like this and uh, use the Y Combinator and have my, my recursive Lambda. And so I did this and I felt very pleased with myself because I, I love the Y Combinator. It's really cool. I do think it's a beautiful algorithm. Um, but when I turned it in and I showed up at the interview, they said, why did you introduce all of this complexity for this single line of code? And honestly, I didn't really have a good answer for them. And this kind of comes to the idea of beauty being contextual. Um, you know, there's this tension between me thinking that this, this algorithm is beautiful and amazing, 
uh, and the functional beauty of now having this mass of awful template code to maintain. You know, there's the tension there. Um, and all, all art and code is contextual to some, um, to some level. Like I never got Kandinsky for some reason until I was in St. Petersburg and I was walking down a corridor and I turned a corner and was just smacked by this painting. And, you know, it was like a physical reaction. I turned the corner and there was just all of this color and energy like right in my face. And this painting is huge, right? It was, it was a physical reaction. And I'm sure that I had seen this painting before, you know, on the internet or in a textbook or something like this. But it was that context that turning the corner and just feeling this painting, which really made me understand. And now I love this painting. I love Kandinsky. It like changed the way that I looked at, at art in general. So this question is code art. Like we said that this is the wrong question, but but why? And part of the trouble, this is Nelson Goodman, part of the trouble lies in asking the wrong question and failing to recognize that a thing may function as a work of art at some times and not at others. In crucial cases, the real question is not what objects are permanently works of art, but when is an object a work of art? Or more briefly, when is art? I really, really like this quote because it gets the idea of art being contextual. And code works in the same way. You might come across uh, a piece of code in, in a code base or on GitHub or in some other talk that you've seen today, and you might be appreciating it for its functional qualities. Um, but maybe it's not until I put up a piece of code on a slide in a talk about art philosophy and ask you if something is beautiful that you really consider it. Context. Okay, that's what I have to say about beautiful code. On to code art. So I think one of the reasons that Fred asked me to give this talk is because I do run a, um, an art journal of code as art. Uh, it has two issues. I'm way over June finishing the third issue. Sorry. But I publish not generative art necessarily. It could be generative art, but it's where the, the code itself is the art, not just the thing which it's producing. Um, so here's an example. This is a poem. It says, hello world, a far cry of albatross smooth by rocks, by mudded wave. I'm here world beyond laws held by silences and shouts and tear drops darkened by an unclear dome. So this is a, a poem, maybe you would agree. It has the form of poetry, has the, the sounds, the rhythms of poetry. It uses poetic language. Um, this is also part of a program. This is part of a Hello World program in a language which I designed called Enjam. Um, and there's a few interesting parts of this language in that the form of the poem changes the function of the code and vice versa. And in Jam, the, um, each line is an instruction and the instruction in codes is determined by its length, which means that code which does a lot of IO operations, well, IO operations happen to be encoded by very long lines. So IO heavy code will actually read slower. And on the other hand, if you have lots of arithmetic operations, those are encoded by much smaller lines. So it will almost feel like the poem is speedier to read. Um, and then there's labels. If you have code which is jumping around a lot, like doing functions or loops, things like that, there'll be a lot of repetition in your poem because that's how labels are defined. So we, we designed this in a way that the if you're trying to write a certain program, you're kind of constrained in the kind of poem that you can write. And if you want to write a certain kind of poem, you're constrained in the kind of program which you can write. Another example, um, this is a piece from Alice Street. And the left-hand side is a program which is interpreted by a Python program. And it um, attempts to look back at the history of programming back when things like core memory were actually physically stitched together, mostly by women, um, trying to look at the relationship between traditional women's work and, um, and code. 
the left hand side is a program, but it's also a piece of art which looks back at our history. And then the piece of um, the piece on the right is what is output by the code, and that is also a piece of art. Also, so the piece on the left is code and art, and then it's producing art. And these are also questioning our history. This is a piece called Flow by Richard Carter. This is a programming language. The programming language is defined in terms of these partial circles and the connections which they make. And I love that you can literally visualize the flow of data and operations in this programming language. And it's like, not only can you see that, but it's beautiful, I think. And then maybe on the more side of a Bekshinsky painting, we have something like a Hello World program in a programming language defined entirely in empty folders on a file system. I burst into laughter on first seeing this, it's wonderful. Or maybe we use our code, um, try to push poetry into our code, like this um, piece called Fortifications, which is written in Swift, but it's a poem where the form of the code is kind of broken in order to show what the poem is. I thought this piece was really beautiful. Uh, just a couple more I want to show. Well, three more. This is a piece called Around the Clock. If you have ever had to you know, clock in to work or fill in complex Gantt charts or do like planning poker and plan your time like this and everything turns into just this monster of time all tangled together. I really love this visualization. Uh, one piece that maybe you'll recognize um, is basic.hppp by Bjorn Fahler, uh, where this is C++ code, but it tries to emulate basic through macros and labels. And I thought this was wonderful and trying to encode one language in another just by you know, forcing it as hard as you can into the, um, the functions which are available to you. Uh, finally, this program, Unsafe Launch Missiles, is a bash script which simultaneously questions the language we use in our code and also the potential for our code to cause um, catastrophes in our larger world, essentially. So all of this code functions as art to me. Let's talk about language. This is a poem called Matina by uh, Giuseppe Ungaretti. And this is the entire poem. Matina means morning. So the poem is Mi Lumino Dimenso. And this is a contraction of Mi Illumino Di Immenso. Um, broadly translated, it could mean I illuminate myself of immenseness. This isn't necessarily completely right because there's a lot going on in just these four words. Like this, these first two words, mi illumino, this is uh, from the verb illuminirsi, which is uh, called a reflexive verb. A reflexive verb is one where the, the subject, the thing doing the action is the same as the object, the thing having the action done to them. We have these in English, like to wash oneself, I wash myself, you wash yourself. Uh, Italian has way more reflexive verbs than English does. Like um, in English, we might say, I feel marvelous. But in Italian, you would have to say, I feel myself marvelous. There's more of an, an action to it. There's more of a, a searching for yourself. Like this is not a feeling which is on the surface and you can just say, oh, I'm feeling this. It's like you have to look within yourself to say how you're feeling. And it's the same here. This I illuminate myself. There's more of an activity to it. Then even this preposition, D, it's quite often just translates to of, but it could be about or with or by. There's a lot of, depending on the context, B means different things. So which one does it mean here? Well, it depends how you look at the poem. And then even this last word, immense. So this isn't um, the noun immensity. That would be uh, immensita. This is the, the adjective, like immenseness, the, the concept of being immense. So even in these four words, there's so much that we can't necessarily directly translate, but 
it makes us think about the language. It makes us think about how we express ourselves even more. So we, we can maybe translate this in different ways, less literally, like uh, one translation I saw was, I flood myself with light of the immense. Or an even less literal translation, my sun inside rises from space. These are all times people have tried to take things from the original language and reflect them into a new one. And we do the same in code. Here's some common Lisp data. Here's some common Lisp code. You may notice that these look, these look very similar. You know, there's a few differences, like there's a lot more double quotes on the left-hand side, things like that. But broadly, these have the same form. And that is because Lisp code is also data. And because of that, we can write a Lisp program which takes Lisp code as an input and outputs more Lisp code by transforming it somehow. And doing something like this, we can make our own domain-specific languages for looping, for instance, which actually exists in common Lisp. You could say, like, loop with this list and this list, and for each item in this list, repeat it eight times and then collect them into a new list. We can do this. I think this is actually one of the reasons why Lisp never quite got the, the amount of um, penetration into the industry that it should have because it's too easy to write an embedded domain-specific language in Lisp. It's almost trivial to express yourself at your level of intent, so much that like pretty much every Lisp program becomes its own programming language at some point, or even several, which is wonderful for expressing yourself, but less so if you're a group of people and you want to get stuff done. Um, but when I first saw this and I understood that the code could be data and you could manipulate the code in the same way that you could make, manipulate anything else. It completely blew my mind and made me think about how I could represent this in other languages, how I could take what I had learned and put it somewhere else. And you know, Lisp macros have been very, very influential. Like you know, Rust, Rust macros are not exactly similar because the, the format's different. They have to have their own. API essentially for manipulating the syntax tree, but they're very much influenced by uh, Lisp macros. Even looking at something like the, the meta classes proposal for, for C++, this is the same kind of thing. We're writing code to take code as input and output new code. Um, I even read a book on the neuroscience of aesthetic experience for this talk. And one of the really interesting things I found was so the aesthetic response enables the comparison and integration of novel kinds of reward in a process that opens up possibilities for new knowledge or new ways of negotiating the world. The perceptions, images, and emotions we find through our experience of poetry, painting, and music put ideas and events into relation with one another that would rarely, if ever, be possible outside the arts. Read this quote and tell me that is not what happens when we write code and when we understand something new from some other language or some library. And that gives us new ways of negotiating the world. It gives us putting these events and ideas into relation, um, give us new experiences, new ways to express ourselves. I think this is the same. Another example, look at this um, piece of Haskell code. This is code which gets a cute cat, takes in an image, and it maybe returns an image. Um, you know, maybe we can't do these things. Maybe we try to crop the image to a cat and it's actually a picture of a dog, so we can't do that. We return nothing. Uh, we try to add a bow tie, but you know, the cat has its back turned or something, so we return nothing. Um, oh, I said at the start earlier when we were getting prepared that my talk does not have cats in it, but of course my talk does have cats, just not any pictures of them. Um, then we try to make its eyes sparkle, but you know maybe it has its eyes closed and we can't do that, so we return nothing. Um, all of these operations, well, some of these operations could fail, but we don't really have to do anything about it. All we're saying is we want to crop to cat, we want to add a bow tie, we want to make its eyes sparkle, we want to do all of these things. We don't care about this additional context of maybe something fails and we have to back out later. And that's achieved using these magical operators, which map onto monads and functors. But when, if you try to um, 
translate this to C++, maybe your first attempt looks something like this. Again, don't spend too much time reading this, but basically the idea is every time you want to do an operation, you have to check if it fails and then return an all opt. And then you have to dereference the result and then call function and check if it failed again. You have to manually move things in and out of contexts, which we don't really like doing. When I first saw and understood this kind of Haskell code, when I understood what it's doing, when I understood monads and functors and all of these things, I it changed how I looked at code. It changed the things that I could do in my code. And it made me be able to write something like this. Or I can say, crop the cat and then add a bow tie and then make it size sparkle. All of these things. This is going to come in C23 because I wrote a proposal for it and got accepted. Like these are the kinds of things that we get when we're our minds are open to new experiences, both from art and code. Like another example is if you if you hear microtonal music for the first time, for example, like you're open to a whole new world of sounds outside what you might have experienced before. It gives you new ways of looking at the world. I think it's the same with code. Let's move on from language, talk about discovery. This quote is really fascinating. So this is by Serge Lang on the beauty of doing mathematics. It's much easier to make you listen to some music than to make you do mathematics. Because to listen to music, you're in a passive state. You're taken in by the musical aesthetic and you let the composer and the interpreter take the active part. But to do mathematics, you need a much higher degree of concentration and a personal effort. Now, there are parts of this I agree with and parts of it I don't. I'm not going to argue on that it's easier to make someone listen to music than do maths. Like, I would definitely go to a party and maybe put some music on and maybe ask someone what they thought of it or something like that, make conversation about it. I'd probably not go to a party and say, hey, I brought some abstract algebra worksheets. Uh, I mean, maybe, maybe I would if it was the right party, but um, probably not. So I'm not going to um, take offense on that, but this passivity, I don't think when you listen to music, you're in a passive state. I think that's completely wrong. And the literature on aesthetics tends to agree with me there. Um, like Monroe Beardsley um, came up with a set of things which he thought categorized um, aesthetic experience. And one of those was active discovery. Active discovery defined like this, a sense of actively exercising, constructing powers of the mind, of being challenged by a variety of potentially conflicting stimuli to try to make them hear. A keyed up state amounting to exhilaration in seeing connections between percepts and between meanings. Like this is not a way in which the beauty of mathematics or code and the beauty of art or music or painting are different. This is a way that they're similar. This is a way they're the same. Let's look at the Floyd, Floyd Warshall algorithm. I just put some code up on the screen. You don't know what it did, but what it does, unless you happen to know the Floyd Warshall algorithm off the top of your head, which maybe you do. Maybe you just looked at this. I could ask you if you thought it was beautiful. I wouldn't know if you'd have a good answer right now. Maybe you like the form of it. Maybe you like how it looks. Maybe you like how I laid it out on the page. I don't know. But a lot of its beauty would come from the discovery. So let's do some discovering. So this algorithm takes in a graph, which is expressed as um, it's a, a weighted directed acyclic graph. So it's expressed as um, weights between every between pairs of nodes in the graph. This algorithm initializes an adjacency matrix to the, the current set of weights. Then it iterates. Every iteration is going to consider one additional point in the graph. It will start off um, not looking at any nodes, then we'll look at just one, then two, then three, and then so forth. On every additional node we look at, we're going to consider every pair of nodes in the graph. Then what we do is we um, check, is the distance between the first in the pair to the new node plus to the new, from the new node to the second pair shorter than the distance that we already know between these two um, nodes? And if it is, we're going to record it. This algorithm in about five lines of code calculates every single shortest 
distance between every pair of nodes in a directed acyclic weighted graph in five lines of code. I think that's amazing. I think that's beautiful. I think this is a beautiful algorithm. But it wasn't until I understood it before I discovered um, that I thought that it was beautiful. It was in that discovery and that working through that I discovered its beauty. And uh, Paul Erdos actually speaks about this uh, with reference to mathematics. If you don't know Paul Erdos, this is where the idea of the, the Erdos number comes from, um, which is the number of times you are removed in, um, in mathematical publications from someone who published with Paul Erdos because he published, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of papers. I, I literally can't remember. Many, many papers. We had this idea of uh, the book, which was... Um, a book written by God containing all of the beautiful proofs and algorithms that exist. And that when you discover a new proof or algorithm, you're not creating it, you're not writing it, you're discovering something which already exists in this book. And it's the discovery which is beautiful. He said that you don't have to believe in God, but you should believe in the book. <laughs> uh, another note on on the neuroscience of this, like there is a lot of similarity here in how we func we process code and how we func uh, we process art. Um, this book that I read said that neural activation moves. This is when you you have an aesthetic experience. Then neural activation moves from sensory cortex forward towards the basal ganglia for reward processes. So that higher order complex processes of cognition and emotional and reward processes may continually feed into one another. This like reward process is apparently a very, very strong part of the aesthetic experience. And I think that's what we get when we discover this code as well. When we understand what it's going, we have that like moment of enlightenment. We get what this does now. I think this is another way that art and code are not different. It's the way that, uh, that they're the same. Moving further on a similar topic, knowledge. Uh, John Berger writes, the way we see things is affected by what we know or what we believe. In the Middle Ages, when men, men believed in the physical existence of hell, the sight of fire must have meant something different from what it means today. What you know changes how you see things changes how you see art, it changes how you see code, changes how you see anything. On a very, very basic level, like if I show you this poem, you don't know what it means unless you know Italian. Just like if I show you this Lisp program, you don't know what it means unless you know Lisp. But on a deeper level, like let, let's look at a piece of art, okay? Let's look at this painting. I want you to look at this painting for a bit. I want you to look at the, the faces of the subject in the painting, how they're posed, how they hold themselves, how they're represented. I want you to think about what the artist who painted this thinks about the subjects of this painting. Does he like them? Does he hate them? How, what does he think they think about themselves? How could this be represented in the painting? So I'll tell you that this was painted by Franz Hals. Um, at this stage of his life, he was in his 80s, he was destitute, he was freezing to death. And these are the governesses of a charity which gave him enough peat to burn to survive the winter as long as he painted them. Knowing that, does that change what you feel about this painting? Does that change how you see it? Does it change? what you think the artist thought about these people as he was painting them. Do you think he was grateful to them for helping him? Do you think he thought they, you know, these are, are rich people with their servant at the, the top right there? What do you think he thought of them? The, the knowledge that I shared with you changes how you look at the painting and so that, that's showing the knowledge affecting how we see things, but it's also the environment um, impacting the art, which is another way that art and code are kind of the same. Like this is a man who is suffering under capitalism, almost dead, 
who is forced to perform for the rich in order to survive, which will be very familiar to anyone who's written code while crunching so you can make enough money to pay your rent and how that affects your code. But it's also how we view something like this. The knowledge of the, how this program works lets us access its beauty. Let's move on to execution. I'm gonna read you out uh, an excerpt from a poem. This is Fountains of Aix. A goddess is driving a chariot through water. Her reins and whips are tight white water. Bronze hoofs of horses wrangle with water. Marble faces half hidden in leaves. Faces whose hair is leaves and grapes of stone are peering from living leaves. Faces with mossy lips unlocked, always uttering water, water. Wearing their faces, their features blank, their ears deaf, their eyes mad or patient or blind or astonished at water, always uttered out of their mouths. Now, maybe when you see this poem, maybe you think the form is beautiful. I certainly do. The way the, the water literally runs down the side of the poem is incredible. I like how the rest of it is hewn shaped. It's a beautiful form of, for a poem. This is just an excerpt, but the, the entire poem looks like this. So maybe you think that the, the form is beautiful, but the poem is more than the form of it. It's more than the words on the page, it's the, the execution. It's me reading it to you or you reading it from the page, you feeling the, the rhythm of it, feeling how the words sound, feeling the meaning, trying to extract what you can from this poem. You have to, you have to run this poem in your mind. This is like running code, right? And people agree with me that Cox McLean and Ward say that code retains some of poetry's rhythm and metrical form. Code is intricately crafted and expressed in multitudinous and idiosyncratic ways. Like poetry, the aesthetic value of code lies in its execution, not simply in its written form. To appreciate it fully, we need to see the code to fully grasp what it is we are experiencing and to build an understanding of the code's actions. There were talking specifically about generative code here, but I think it applies to, to other code as well. But if we do look specifically at generative code, take an example like this. Uh, this is a piece called Flocking by Daniel Holden and Chris Kerr. They have a, a whole um, suite of code poems which are available on the internet um, and also in book form. I highly recommend, they're really beautiful. But here we have a poem at the top and a program at the bottom and their forms mirror each other, but also the code executes and the code generates art. It's kind of similar to that over under piece we saw with the, um, the pink background. This is code, which is art, it's generating art, but it's also, we cannot extract that part of the execution from its beauty. It's beautiful in its form, but it's also beautiful in its execution. All right, let's talk about representation. Let's go for Schopenhauer again. We love Schopenhauer. The world is my representation, he said. And what he meant by this was that um, there is no world without someone to, uh, to process it, to link things together, to create concepts out of nothing. The world is our representation as much that it's inextricable from how we view it. And of course, in code, we represent the world in UML. I'm kind of joking there, but like when we are, when we write code, we are modeling something, we're representing something. We're, often we're representing the world reflected through the domain of our program, trying to extract the salient properties we need from the objects under our view and discarding the rest. Nelson Goodman writes, the many stuffs, matter, energy, waves, phenomena that worlds are made of are made along with the worlds, but made from what? Not from nothing after all, but from other worlds. World making as we know it always starts from worlds already at hand. The making is a remaking. When we write this keyword class, when we link it together with other classes, when we build a model, we're building a world out of the world around us, both that world 
in the physical sense, representing, abstracting things in front of us, but also that world of ideas, that platonic realm of ideas. We're putting together our own world. On that subject of um, art as imitation, we were talking about representation. Nelson Goodman also writes, to make a faithful picture, come as close as possible to copying the object just as it is. The simple-minded injunction baffles me. The object before me is a man, a swarm of atoms, a complex of cells, a fiddler, a friend, a fool, and much more. If none of these constitute the object as it is, what else might? If all are the ways the object is, then none is the way the object is. I cannot copy all these at once. The more nearly I succeed, the less would the result be a realistic picture. I love the way that this takes that idea of art as imitation, that like platonic idea, and turns it on its head a bit. It says, not only are we, sure, we are abstracting things, we're representing things, we're not copying entirely, but that's better than if we could copy the, the, the entire thing. And it's the same in code. Like we can't possibly represent, if we're trying to represent some object, we can't possibly represent absolutely everything about it. We're taking what we need and that's better. Um, about a certain painting, Arthur Danter writes, the artist did not paint her the way she would look if photographed, but rather as she was. I love this quote so much. It's about a uh, woman with a hat by Henri Matisse. Um, and he's right, like, this is not how this woman, this is Matisse's uh, wife. This is not how she would look in a photograph, right? Like, she would not have this green smudge on her face or, or on her nose. Uh, her clothes, if those colours were actually in real life, this dress would look bizarre. Uh, this headdress, the shape of it, the colours would also look bizarre. The colours behind her are are not realistic. There's nothing... This picture is not realistic in the sense that like Renaissance painters would say is realistic, but it's trying to represent her as she is, not how she would look photographed. Matisse is trying to represent something about her wife, about his wife, or um, he was trying to say something about who she was. He was taking the parts of her which he wanted to express and leaving the rest behind, and that's better than the, the imitation, the, the full picture. And I think we do the same with code. When we code, we build our own world, piece together from the real and the imagined. And that's better than if we took absolutely everything and tried to fit it into our programs. Okay, so those are the subjects I wanted to talk about. Let's go right back to the start and revisit the the history. So we talked about art as imitation, and you know we just saw this example with uh, this painting by Matisse that um, sure we're maybe imitating something, or maybe we're representing, or we're abstracting. But for our purposes of both code and art, that's actually better. But also, code gives us access to that platonic world of pure thought stuff away from the physical world. It gives us almost a cross-section of reality. We can tap into the pure ideas. We can uh, imitate or represent things in our physical world, like this example from Alice Street, where it's both representing that thing in the real world, like that um, sewing motion and both it, and also its relation to history and the history of computing but it's also a program executing in logic these are both physical reality and ideas we talked about beauty and skill from the renaissance and this comes into um how we look at code as well and functional beauty if you think that this is beautiful because of how uh, the skill of putting it together and expressing it, or if you think that this algorithm is beautiful because of the skill in crafting it and, and discovering it. People originally thought that beauty is essential, but then people tended to come over to the idea that it's subjective. And it's the same in code, like, I might think that this is beautiful because it's bizarre and otherworldly. You might not. You might think this is beautiful. I might not. That's okay. Um, Baumgarten said art functions cognitively and perceptionally. We've seen so many examples of that, like um, flocking, which we saw just earlier, um, functioning 
cognitively because it's executing code. We can try and understand this code if we wanted to. It would be a cognitive pursuit, but it's also aesthetic. It's There's poetry, the way that it's formed is beautiful. The way these forms reflect each other is beautiful. The thing which it uh, produces when it executes is beautiful. Kant said beauty claims universality. I disagree. I can say this is beautiful. I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong if you don't. I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong if you don't think Bekshinsky paintings are beautiful. Well, maybe I will. Or Kandinsky. It's not something which we can claim universality for. Kant also said that aesthetic experience is purposive without purpose. And again, this is wrong. Like, these spoons, they have some purpose. You might think they're beautiful. Art can be functional. This uh, lisp loop, uh, this lisp macro, it does something. It has some function. I can still find it beautiful. So coming back right to the start, is code art? Who cares? This is the wrong question. And we can ask better ones. We can ask, can I experience code as art? Sure, I have. You've seen plenty of examples of things which I think are art and which are also code in this talk. Can my code reflect me? Yes, we saw in Kate Gregory's talk that our code reflects the emotions we put into it. Our code can be a reflection of us. We can put it in ourselves into our code. It can be a creative endeavor. Can code be beautiful? I think so. What do you think? Thank you. All right, I will now take some questions. Feel free to drop them in uh, the Zoom Q&A or the, um, the Discord chat as well. So I got one question from Victor. What's my favorite 20th century uh, painter or sculptor? Uh, I'm a big fan of John William Tristram. He's an uh, um, Australian watercolor artist. Uh, his pieces are really, really ethereal and dreamlike. I highly recommend they're gorgeous. All-time favorite? Oh, I don't know. Like, as far as visual art goes, I tend to watch more experimental films than I... I mean, I, I don't spend a lot of time at art galleries these days because that means you have to go outside. But, um, yeah, I don't think I could have an all-time favorite. <laughs> Maybe I'll think more about it. Uh, Sandor says... Interesting that you mentioned virtue and related beauty. Some claim that we misunderstood the meaning of virtue and it was meant by the Greeks as excellence. Ah, this is an interesting point because not only that, but the, the word for um, beauty in Greek, uh, which I think is, is kolos, I, I can't remember, but that is also not necessarily exactly the same as our modern understanding of beauty either and was more um, related to, um, to physical um, beauty as much as I understand it. But yes, there is um, there is a lot in translation from Greek, which um, changes how we might interpret um, Greek aesthetics. And that affects a lot because so much was built on Greek aesthetics. Uh, it's interesting. Um, and Sandor is, 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 is excellence beautiful then? And I think that kind of comes into the, that idea of functional beauty, which we talked about. Um, so I, I'm going to say, sure, yeah. <laughs> what role do you think symmetry plays in beauty in general and, and code in particular from Victor? Um, I don't know. I think symmetry is a tool. I think that um, people can use symmetry um, to achieve a certain purpose and to present a certain aesthetic, and sometimes that can be beautiful. Um, but it can also be misused as well. I think, yeah, I think symmetry is a tool like, like anything else, um, which can contribute to beauty or can, can even be a, a detractor from it. Uh, Fitch says, do I think that there are things, ideas universally beautiful to humans? And can I talk about things that transcend culture and implicitly location and era? So yeah, this is another important part that the idea of what is beautiful has changed so much over time and also in um, geographical location and the culture. Um, I, I don't purport to 
I, I can't say a thing about things which are universally beautiful to to everyone that, that transcend culture. I, I think that there's so much that we inherit from our culture and how we view the world and the political situation that uh, our um, our political situation also affects so much how we view the world um, that I, I don't think I could say that there are things which are fundamentally beautiful. I'm, it's not a question which I, I spent a lot of time thinking about because I, I think it's almost impossible to do. Like You cannot extricate yourself from the culture and political situation in which you have uh, been brought up and existed fully like you can deconstruct it sure um but there's always going to be some ways that, that you're affected by it um from george i mentioned a ton about paintings and how they might relate to code aesthetics do i have possible thoughts about other types of media such as film or music yeah that's a really good point i did so i i did spend most of my time talking about um visual art um we, we touched on poetry a little bit as well. Um, oh, Marshmallow is outside my door screaming now. Maybe I should let him in. Uh, we'll see, maybe after I've asked these questions, answered these questions. Um, do I have thoughts on other kind of media? I, I think that, um, you know, people talk a lot about sister arts of the, the, the main kind of styles of, of art and how there's so much shared between like music and poetry and, and writing and, Things like that. I, I think that there's so much shared in general between um, different arts and how we we experience them. Uh, the film, in particular, I think. Um, so it, one of my favorite directors is Tarkovsky, who wrote that um, film is like sculpting in time, and I always liked that idea of applying it to code as well, like that that idea of sculpting with pure thought stuff for code um you know code, code is one of the we have access to so many intangible things where we can operate in pure logic um so i i, I like that um kind of connection between how tarkovsky viewed film and and how we we um view coding um Kim says, do you think that code is art in a sense that Kandinsky described it in his books? So everything, dot, line, colors have a clear, sometimes spiritual meaning. So if removed from the whole piece, meanings change, if not collapse, which involve a lot of precise effort from that artist to calculate everything and be uh, aware of the parameters. Uh, I think that, so that there's a lot to this, right? Like there's, uh, there's a lot in the the symbology of art and like context as we were talking about um and that if you if you remove something from some context how does that change the entirety of of the work or that piece in itself um i think that <sighs> I know. I think I would need to think about that question more. It's a it's a very good question. Um, yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that one more. Sorry, that's not a very uh, satisfying answer. Would I consider comments as part of the code or interpretation of it? A sort of meditate uh, mediation between the work of the coder slash artist and the one who's looking at it. I like that a lot. Um, I I think it can be both. I think that comments can provide a lot of different functions. And um, I have seen comments which are art. You know, I've seen people go to great lengths of explaining the, the details of some algorithm, including like diagrams and things like that in comments. And that's, it's wonderful. Um, but yeah, I, I think comments definitely, like you could try and extract the comments out of a piece of code and see how that changed your um, the way that you looked at it and the way that you perceived it, the way you experienced it. I think there's um, yeah, there's that interaction there. Like the removing the the comment would change how you experienced the code, and 
that plays a lot into to the aesthetic experience as well. Um, oh, what about tests? That's, yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, I don't know, I think it depends what you could do with it, right? Like, I'm, I'm not going to tell you that no tests can't be part of a functional piece of program art. I, I think people could, could manage to find ways to make that work. Um, like I said, I'm no essentialist. Uh, do I know the PA programming language where the program is a picture that you navigate in several directions? Yes, that is an amazing language. It's like a, a visual programming language. Um, would highly recommend checking it out. Uh, Arman says, I see, I can see art expression as part of the artist's personality. Do I think it's the same for code writing? Yeah, absolutely. Like Kate said um, about emotional code, you know, there's people who will try to write code in the most uh, empathetic way, which helps the, the user the the, um, the maintainer of the code as much as they can. There's people who will try to, you know, like I did for that interview, try to show off that they're being clever. Um, yeah, definitely, art the code can definitely be an expression of the art, art of the artist's personality. Uh, Cyril says, "My favorite quote: linking beauty and efficiency. How do we convince people that in programming, simplicity and clarity, in short, what mathematicians call elegance, are not a dispensable luxury, but a crucial matter that decides that decides between success and failure? I like that one a lot. Thanks for sharing that. Okay, I think we're out of questions. So thank you everyone very much for coming along. I hope that I gave you new ways of seeing code and art and have a great time. Oh, last one. What role does typography play in code? Yeah, uh, good question. Typography is definitely a way, something which would influence how you um, how you interacted with a piece of code. And in much the same way that, um, you know, if I change the typeface of a poem, it can completely change the character of, of the poem and how, how I read it, how I respond to it. I think that the, the same thing can definitely be true of, of typography. For, for code. Uh, and what do I know about teaching programming in art schools? Maybe it's considered a technique rather than an art. And that's why processing patches are so ugly. Uh, yeah, oh no, I hadn't thought about that. It's a, I, I, I don't know about um, how programming is taught in art schools a lot. That would be a really interesting thing. Like, cause, like that quote that I had right at the start of people saying, you know, um, when we learn programming, we're not taught to, to experience the beauty. Maybe if you're taught programming in, in art schools for doing, doing generative art, maybe you are, I don't know. Uh, if you are, please tell me, that would be really cool to hear. Uh, um, okay, I think I'm gonna finish up there. Thank you everyone very, very much. <laughs>